with okay. Susan Colgrove <laughs> on Monday, September <laughs> the 12th. Right. 1994. <laughs> the inner recesses of the Athens Regional li Library. In her gerbil cage. <laughs> yes. Susan, um, would you tell me a little bit of your experiences during the era of World War II? Okay. I think I remember Pearl Harbor. I would have been pretty close to three years old, and of course I didn't know, I didn't know what was happening, but I do remember being at um, some kind of a, an event with my mother and father, and I don't even know what it was, but everything stopped and someone made an announcement, and nobody said one word, everyone just left. And I knew something I didn't know what it was. I, I didn't know what it was for a long time. Something had changed. And uh, we went straight home, and my daddy, he had a old red armchair and one of these cathedral radios. He sat there, and he turned that radio, and he must have sat by that radio all night long. Uh, I remember falling asleep on the floor, and I remember the voice. But, of course, I, I didn't know what had happened, just that something had happened that was very important. Um, maybe, maybe that's a figment of my imagination. I was very young, but, but I have memories from, from being very, very young. I guess, I was born in 1939, so probably the war was something I grew up with, um, I was reared with. I can, I do remember when the war was over, I didn't understand what that meant. And that was in 1946. I, yeah, yeah, 45, 46. I was seven or eight years old, and somebody said the war was over, and I didn't know what that meant. So obviously, as I grew up, the war was just something I took for granted. Um, I was mentioning to you earlier that at some point on a, on a Christmas, and I had to have been very small because I also got a little wooden train that was a pull toy. So, so I had to have been a very young child. Santa Claus brought me a baby doll had a cloth body, had um, plastic or wooden arms and legs, but it was soft and floppy and it was supposed to be a newborn baby. So it had a newborn baby face, which of course had squinty eyes. And I would, when I took my baby doll outside, I would cover her face with a blanket because I, I was ashamed for everyone to see that Santa Claus had made a mistake and he brought me a Japanese baby. Um, I can remember my mother being real surprised when she heard me tell that to someone and she said oh well all newborn babies look like that and of course then I thought all newborn babies were born to be Japanese babies so I had to have been very little and I had no rational understanding of anything it, it, when I think back on it it's a kaleidoscope of impressions of sensations of aromas and textures and colors and um, it's almost like if ever you've seen any of those terrible cartoons from World War II um, where the enemy is depicted in, in comic, monstrous ways. That's the way it was. Uh, on one hand, I had this vivid, vivid child's imagination. On the other hand, I was living in an era where something very, very terrible was happening and uh, certainly made for rich memories about that. I can remember having the conception that Hitler was this big monster. And my Uncle John, who brunette and, and um, actually really maybe looked a little bit like Hitler, used to put, a, put his comb, his hair comb under his nose and crawl around on the floor snarling like an animal. And all the kids, I mean, we would run. And it, it was fun, but but do you see what I mean about that comic horror kind of thing there? He would crawl around on the floor. He'd comb his hair over his head and then crawl around the floor with his comb held under his nose, snarling like an animal. And all the children, of course, until my grandmother would finally make him stop, we would all shriek and romp up and down on the porch. And, and uh, I guess in a way it was good because... It was very serious, but there was a way to deal with the fear 
express it when you know it's Uncle John and not Hitler. <laughs> But, Where were you living at the time? Okay, I was in Jacksonville Beach, Florida. I lived at 103 8th Avenue North, and the house is gone now. I, I just recently made a trip to Jacksonville, and I went, and the, the little house my grandmother lived in is gone. A lot of people don't know, even though there has recently been a PBS program, a lot of people don't know that there was a lot of submarine activity off the coast of Florida. We had to have blackout shades over our windows. At night, when we did have a light, even when we had the blackout shades down, my daddy would put four couch cushions together, and we would have the lamp inside of them. We weren't allowed to open the door and let light show out. Uh, there were ships torpedoed. As a matter of fact, there was a banana boat torpedoed because, well, well back in those days, you slept with all the windows open. You know, once once we turned out all the lights, we we. We had the windows wide open. In the middle of the night, we heard people yelling, and oh, you could see the ocean from my bedroom window. And there was this terrible glow on the horizon. Everybody went down and stood on the beach and looked at it, and it, it was a ship right over the horizon being torpedoed. And for, oh, for days and days afterward, bunches of bananas, I mean, as big as a small car, green bananas would uh, wash up on the shore. And of course, the salt water had, had spoiled them. No one, no one could retrieve the bananas and eat them. But it was just a banana boat that was torpedoed. Um, another time, someone found a black rubber raft buried in the sand at Ponte Vedra Beach, which was maybe six or eight miles, maybe ten miles south of where we lived. And that meant spies here shore. So I guess it kind of it sounds like an adventure story. And I was very secure. I was a very secure child. And, and maybe the security of that warm, wonderful family, it was almost like watching an adventure, except I knew. You know, I, I knew it was real. My grandmother was a shore watcher. What is a shore watcher? Oh kind of like civil defense you 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 watch you go take your binoculars and you watch the ocean you watch the air if you see a plane you you call in and identify by walkie-talkie you would call in identify the plane um, you would know what kind of plane it is and you would tell what direction it was going in and I thought when my grandmother would do her shore watch I always went with her and she was a very big very tall, very dynamic woman. She had raven black hair. She had a big prominent nose. She had what we call gander blue eyes, so pale they were almost gray. And when she would put on that helmet and stand on that seawall, I couldn't get enough of looking at her. I, I guess maybe that's why I never did buy the thing about women being the weaker sex not growing up watching this woman. And she'd stand there and look out at sea with her binoculars. And I thought there was a distinct possibility this monster Hitler sea would come rolling over in a rowboat. And I thought my grandmother was protecting the whole United States. And I knew she could take him. I knew she could fight him hand-to-hand -hand combat and stomp him. So I, I guess there was an enormous amount of security um, it, it was just funny as, as I got older and understood that it would not be one person in a rowboat. Um, I had to kind of smile at my very simplistic way of, of looking at it. I can remember once when it was almost time for us to go down to the beach for her shore watch. And I loved it. You know, I just loved it. And I was standing in a chair at her bedroom window looking out at the ocean maybe even pretending that I was her. And I remember seeing what I thought was a torpedo. It was, it was a blimp. It was a dirigible. It was coming over the land from the sea. But I thought it was a torpedo. And I remember falling off the chair, running to get her, you know, trying to pull her down on the floor for this torpedo would come. And, and I remember she went out on the porch and looked up and she just laughed and laughed and she came back and hugged me and 
explained to me what it was and that it did look like a torpedo. So it, it sounds like those were real traumatic experiences, and, but there was so much security, there was so much love and so much acceptance that I don't remember it as a bad time. I, I really don't remember it that way at all. My job, and of course, you know, my grandmother lived in one house. My mother and father and I lived in a house about three blocks away, but my daddy ran a shoe store and my mama helped him all the time. So I spent an enormous amount of time with my grandmother. But because my daddy ran the shoe store, he was the first person in town to get this stuff in stock called leg lotion. Now women couldn't get silk stockings anymore because all the silk was going to parachutes. And he got in a shipment of leg lotion. And he, oh, if you were to open a bottle of it right now, I would know the aroma. It, I guess olfactory memory is such a strong one. My mother would rub leg lotion, it was just makeup, rub leg lotion on her legs. And when it dried, it would look as if she were wearing stockings. But then it was my job to take the eyebrow pencil and draw the line for the seams down the back of her leg. And I was the one who could draw the straightest line. So I was the one who was selecting. I can remember how, always being real proud of how pretty she looked. And uh, she looked just like she had on silk stockings like a real lady's supposed to wear. But it was just so funny because, I mean, like, as soon as the leg lotion came in, my daddy's store was just mobbed by every woman in town because there was a lot of pride. There was vanity. There was a lot of pride in using leg lotion instead of, I mean, if anybody had had silk stockings, they wouldn't dare to have wear them. They would have been so off. They, they may have been attacked. Uh, there was this feeling of we're sacrificing together. And nobody had anything. Um, there was a family in Jacksonville Beach. I don't remember their names. They had around the edge of their yard a huge chain. It was a decorative chain. It was it was iron. And when the when we began all giving metal for the war effort, they refused to give their chain. And let me tell you something, from the minute that word got around, I mean it was a decorative chain. It I mean people were giving their towing chains from their cars. They they were things that really were needed. This was a decorative chain. Word got around town about that. The grocery store refused to sell them groceries. Came into my daddy's shoe store with her three children and he said, I am just as sorry as I can be, but in all good conscience, I cannot sell you my shoes. And the boy, I mean, the trash truck quit picking up their trash. You, they, they couldn't get, they couldn't do anything. And in about two weeks, they changed their minds and gave up their chain. And as soon as they did, they were welcomed back into the community. They really were. They could buy groceries again. <laughs> they could get shoes. Um, you think they held a grudge? <laughs> I, you know, I really don't know. I think the people in the town mm -hmm. never forgot it. Because if you'd have to be forced to do anything. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Huh? Okay. All and, right. Um, Sorry for the interruption there. That's nothing. It's oh, okay. okay. It again. Um, did you have brothers and sisters? I had one sister who was 11 years older than me. And this boy really gave me another view. She, okay, how do I describe this? I never even thought of it before. All right, there was a big pier in Jacksonville Beach. It was a fishing pier. But about three quarters of the way down the pier, there was this big dance hall called the Flag. Um, on the dance hall, there was more pier where you could go out and fish. But Every single Saturday night, there were dances at the flag sponsored by the USO for the sailors and for the, the military people. And every Saturday night, my grandmother, my mother, my older sister and I would go to the flag. And 
I watched jitterbugging. I mean, I was too little. I can remember sitting on the floor and looking through the cracks at the ocean below. That was beautiful, too. You know, I mean, this was built out on the pier. And the, the breakers, you could, if a big breaker came, you could feel it hitting the, the poles that held this big dance hall up. They had live music. They had the girls in the bobby socks. They did the jitterbug. They did all the kind of dancing you could ever imagine. Um, so I got to see her angle, too, being a young woman and very, very pretty. And all the sailors wanted to dance with her, and of course. And this was fine. The whole community, was, my grandmother was there. My mother would, believe me, my sister would not have gone without my grandmother and my mother and me in tow. But there was this, I don't know, this festive, festive kind of feeling there. There was nothing that was too good for the, for the, the, uh, the soldiers and sailors. Other nights and afternoons, we would, all the four of us, my grandmother, my mother, my sister, myself, we'd go to the USO, where my grandmother sold donuts and coffee, or gave them away, I guess, and my mother, I don't know, she was in charge of a group of ladies who did something or other. My sister would, talk with them. Now, they didn't have dancing in the USO itself that I recall. And I played checkers with them, and they all let me win. They all let me I mean, I thought I was the greatest checker player in the world. So many of these fellows had younger sisters. And we would all just spend the entire afternoon down there at the old USO doing everything we could for, for the boys in uniform. That was... And that was a supportive community. Um, I think it was a good place to be during the war to get to see the positive, the positive, well, I mean, there had to be positive sides, to get to see the, the effort. And I think that's what gets me a little bit antsy with the way things are now. And, and maybe I sound like one of these crotchety old biddies, talks about the good old days. but. I'm so tired of hyphenated Americanism. I mean, we divide ourselves every way possible. Race, gender, age, beliefs, non-beliefs, preferences. I mean, we're just, we're like a big giant jigsaw puzzle. We're all got all these edges around us. And I find that very hard to take, having grown up in such in the middle of such a concentrated effort it was for survival and we knew that i can remember wondering once if if we lost how hard it would be to learn to speak german wow yeah i do i really really remember that worrying about it just a little bit had you started school by 1945 well let's say 1944 <laughs> I would have been in the first grade. Mm -hmm. I would have been in the first grade. And um, I can remember I didn't like school. It must have been pretty tame after. <laughs> it must have been pretty tame after all these years of being in the middle of this activity and this concentration and uh, this devotion. I do, I do remember, and I'm trying to think, when was the Lindbergh baby kidnapped? That was, I believe, in the early 30s. Okay. There was a statue in the schoolyard dedicated to the Lindbergh baby. Mm -hmm. wow. And it was of uh, an eagle, which, of course, would have, was the symbol for Charles, Charles Lindbergh. I think he was known as the Lone Eagle or something like this. And this, this eagle is lifting this baby up and its wings. And I always, you know, I didn't know what it was. But it, it felt so right to describe the era. All our hopes, the, the infantile hopes, and, and be there no doubt. Th this was not like Vietnam. This wasn't something that was going to happen over there. 
and our lives continued over here as they were, regardless of the outcome, this was, you know, this was survival of our way of life. And I knew that. Um, everyone knew that. Life did not go on as it had before. We had to have rations to get meat or sugar. Uh, my grandmother's friend used to bring me her sugar rations so my grandmother could make cookies for me. Um, another friend of my grandmother's, a lady whose name was Hilda Zanglin. She was not an American, but she was a naturalized American. She was German. And she made her living painting seascapes and watercolors and selling them to the tourists. And the officials began confiscating her paintings. They said that she was painting pictures of the ships that were going in and out of the Mayport Basin. And of course, Jacksonville or St. John's River was the only outlet from the mothball fleet at Green Cove Springs. They were very funny watching the ships going in and out. So they got where every time she finished painting, they'd take it away from her. And my grandmother paid her to paint my portrait in a way to try to help her make a little money. And I still have it. I still have that watercolor painting that Hilda Zanglin did of me. And I can remember being just a little tiny bit embarrassed that my grandma had a German friend. Um, but my grandmother did have a German friend, and she kept that friendship. I always wonder what happened to, to Hilda. And she had a very thick accent. I mean, <laughs> she, she wore hair in big, thick braids. Hilda was Germanic. <laughs> there was no way for her to go low profile. And so Hilda Zanglin and my little, my so-called little Japanese newborn baby doll. <laughs> but um, I was trying to think. I remember, I remember posters that said, a slip of the lip can sink a ship. Where were the posters? In the post office and in front of the movie theater. And I, somebody had to read them to me, okay? So I was very young. Slip of the lip can sink a ship. And it was a big picture of Uncle Sam going like this, you know. If you, you know, you don't talk about things. Um, Do you remember some of the other popular culture of Jacksonville in those years? I remember the movies. Um, and, and of course, you know, Jacksonville Beach was very small, little, little burg. It, it was just a little seaside town. Um, I remember the movies. I remember at the movies, we would, they would have an intermission and we all would, I don't know, purchase something or other in the way of war bonds. It seems like you purchased stamps and then when you purchased ever so many stamps, you got a bond, a war bond for them. But we would, you know, we would always buy those stamps. I remember doing that in kindergarten. Was there, in fact, kindergarten yep. did you, before your first grade? There was kindergarten. Um, I remember it very, very well because I just had the most awful. I just went in there with this king size ego. <laughs> I really did. And um, in the very first day, the teacher said, does anyone know a poem? And I raised my hand. Of course I knew a poem poem my daddy taught me. She said, would you stand up? So I stood up and I said, little Robin Redbreast, sitting on a pole, wiggle waggle, win his tail and toot win his hole. And she dragged me into the bathroom, washed my mouth out with came soap to this day, if I get within breathing distance. And for whatever reason, I turned around the next thing I did was ate my crayons because nobody said you weren't supposed to. And I got stuck with a brown crayon for the rest of the whole year. So, yes, there was kindergarten. <laughs> um, goodness gracious, a whole lot of fuss about a lot of little things I didn't think mattered. Very. My daddy got in big trouble for teaching me that poem. My mama had a fit when she found out I, you know, I had gotten my mouth washed out with came so <laughs> I thought it was a nice poem. I still think it's pretty clever. Um, Were you the youngest <laughs> then? Yep, yep. Um, do you remember your parents talking about politics at all, about, about FDR or Harry Truman or, or, or um, other things of that nature? Yeah. Now, I will, yes, kind of, but my daddy was a very, very quiet, very quiet man. Um, 
he did not talk much about anything. I can remember watching his face while we listened to H.J. Kaltenborn, who was some kind of a wonderful news commentator. And I can remember imitating Kaltenborn's verbal patterns, you know, but I didn't know what the words were. But I can remember listening to Kaltenborn's voice and watching my daddy's face. I, I don't, I don't remember much of anything directly that was said, but I did have the distinct impression that Roosevelt should have kept us out of the war. He should have found a way to keep us out of the war. Knowing now a little history as I do, and understanding what England was going through, um, obviously th there was no way. You know, my grandmother hated Eleanor Roosevelt. I mean, that was the word. I don't know, and I and I, I'm not sure why. Probably because of a lot of the liberal, a uh, liberal attitude. But my grandmother, boy, if my grandmother ever called you Eleanor, you'd had it. You know, you were really in the doghouse. Yes, Eleanor, should say, and she had given you the, the greatest insult to refer to you as Eleanor Roosevelt. <laughs> but no, I don't remember a lot about the politics. I, I really don't. I remember, I do remember when the bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I was incensed recently to see a PBS special that dealt with America's deep regret for doing that bull hockey. Nobody regretted anything. It was survival. Wow, you know, all these bleeding heart people. And maybe if they don't have enough to feel guilty about, they'll go back and try to dredge up something. Well, it wasn't true. It saved hundreds of thousands of allied lives. It brought home boys who wouldn't have come home alive otherwise. And it was a kick you in the you-know-what finale and everyone was thrilled. But what do you remember from that time of that? If you, if you remember them dropping those bombs, do you remember the headlines? Do you remember news on the radio? I do. How did you hear I don't know why I remember this, but I do remember hearing it on the radio wait a minute no I think it it was on a television because I know there was a there was one television in town it was in Adkins drugstore window and everybody in town went and stood in Adkins drugstore window and and watched television once while Kukla Fran and Ollie and things like that it seems to me I remember seeing it on television um, and oddly enough when I heard it I, and I never forgot it. The pilot of the plane was Paul Tibbetts. The name of the plane was the Enola Gay. And that was in the announcement. You know, it went something like, today, the United States has dropped an atomic bomb on Japan. The Enola Gay, piloted by Major Paul Tibbetts, delivered the bomb, and why? why I remember those tiny details, but I know, and I and later I read he named Enola Gay after his mother. Uh, I don't even know where Paul Tibbetts was from, but I do remember that they gave that detail and it stayed for some reason. Um, you know, I can remember once walking past the house. Now, I knew that houses that had red stars in the window meant they had a son fighting. Star, um, silver stars meant there was someone had been wounded or hurt. A gold star was the ultimate sacrifice. Having given your son. I remember a house in Jacksonville Beach that had four gold stars in the window. I mean, I, I'm a mother of two sons. <laughs> I'm a mother of a daughter who served in the military. My little girl, my curly-haired little girl went to boot camp and served in the Navy. Um, I cannot conceive, I cannot conceive of what it must have been like for one family to lose four sons. But that's the way it was. You think anybody felt bad about the bomb? Baloney, baloney. There was jubilation. That, that was the enemy. That was survival, and that was the death blow beyond all 
doubt and no if anybody felt guilty they just wish we could have done it sooner so let me blow that fallacy right out of the water um, so many of the things that I watch and I listen to it's almost like they're going back and rewriting history well it didn't happen that way it didn't happen that way that's a bunch of baloney um, those who forget the past are condemned to repeat it that carries a lot of foul implications but it wasn't that way nobody felt bad it was blast them off the face of the earth and to hell with everything else and that really is the way it was and I don't feel apologetic about it I have some very very fine wonderful Japanese friends I do they are marvelous did, um, did you ever see Japanese Americans or or Japanese of any kind in Jacksonville, Florida in those days. I've never heard much on the East Coast. No. And I'm sure they were, I'm sure there were Japanese Americans, but I never saw them. I, I cannot imagine what would have happened if anyone had seen them. Did, did uh, Jacksonville remain a, a port of call for Navy and, and mm -hmm. types mm -hmm. afterwards? Oh yes, uh, Mayport Naval Station mm -hmm. is still there. Um, Green, the, the mothball fleet at Green Coast Springs, and that was a profound thing to see. My, my mother and daddy took me down there to see it and remind me to tell you the story of their car. <laughs> they were one of the few people, one of the few folks in town who had a car. But they took me down to Green Coast Springs and let me see the mothball fleet. And it was a wonderful thing to see. All these ships after ships, just as far as the eye could see, all covered in this kind of silvery gauze ready to be commissioned, recommissioned, at the drop of a hat. It felt so good to know all that was being held in reserve, that we still had that we could pull out and fight with. Okay, my Uncle Morris worked for, um, I think it's Fullwell Motors in Jacksonville, Florida. Now, this story my mother told to me, and my mother and daddy were going to buy a new Plymouth. They went down to the showroom and my Uncle Morris was automobile salesman and he had in stock a blue Plymouth like they wanted. It was, I don't know what year, tear back Plymouth, you know, a new car. And while my mother and daddy were in the showroom, my daddy had just said to Uncle Morris, would you see if you can get it in black? from is there any place else around that has one in black? I really don't care for that blue. Well, the phone rang and my Uncle Morris went into the office and he answered the phone. And when he came back out, he said, Dwight, I want you to take this car right here and I don't want you to ask me anything. I want you to buy this car. And my daddy said, well, I really wanted a black one. My Uncle Morris just stood there didn't say another word. Looked at him, looked at him, looked at him. So finally my daddy said, all right, Morris, I'll take this one right here. My Uncle Morris handed him the contract. My daddy signed it. My Uncle Morris said, that was the phone call that said, don't sell anymore. The government needs the tires for government vehicles. He said, by all ethics, I could not tell you that. All I could say to you was, I want you to take this car. So my mother and daddy had one of the few cars that had decent tires on it because you couldn't get rubber tires. You know, you couldn't. Rubber went to the war, just like the silk stockings <laughs> went to the war. Everything went to the war. My job was any kind of can my mother opened, she always, she would open one end and then pour the contents out and then open the second end. And I would take it, and she wouldn't let me handle the ends because I guess she thought I'd cut myself. I would take the can and rinse it out and she would rinse out the two ends of the can, put them inside the can, and then I would put it down on the floor and step on it and flatten it. When we had 10, 10 of them, we would tie them together with string and put them out by the street and they would be picked up to be recycled for the war effort. 
Um, man, that was recycling megaton. <laughs> I tell you. Uh, let's see. Um, was there anything you were particularly scared of that you haven't mentioned to me already? No, except those cartoonish kind of characters. And they still play some of those cartoons on television. You really should look at them sometime. Um, I remember there was one, I think it was Bugs Bunny or something, you know, Bugs Bunny, yeah, Bugs Bunny, and he was having, you know, fights with these very, very, very exaggerated Japanese caricatures, and he'd kick them in the pants or something like that. I can remember when that would happen, the theater would just erupt in screams of jubilation. And it wasn't just kids. I mean, I went to matinees where there were just children. You couldn't hear anything anyway. No, this was, this was, this was, these were adults. Everybody would jump up kind of like a Georgia football game or something. No, I, I guess deep down inside, I couldn't imagine that we couldn't win. We had to win. You know, we were the best. We were the best, and we were paying such price. I think I knew deep down inside it, Ultimately, it had to be. But it was a strange world when the war ended. It was like a focus had disappeared. Um, I think people had to go find something. Of course, the boom, yes. But I can remember my mother right after World War II. The women's club had the project of cleaning out the city fountain. And it was a big deal. You know, they had newspaper came down there, made pictures of all these ladies and their, with their hair tied up in rags and their mops and their brooms and their buckets and they were cleaning out the fountain. And I can remember being astounded that anyone would care about something so unimportant, so mundane. So what does it matter? You know, I, I, maybe I still carry that with me. I keep thing to some universal truth or or a universal movement I want things to matter and if they don't matter I don't take truck with them and uh, that may be a leftover kind of interesting I never thought of that before well I often ask during these interviews mm -hmm. something we've kind of been hedging around um, were there heroes and villains did you have heroes did you have villains oh yeah every man in uniform was a hero and from my asthmatic little daddy who was five foot three and weighed 140 pounds, I have a stack of 4F cards. He went once a month down to the recruiting office. Bless his heart, he was so sick. He could hardly walk a block down the street without his lips turning blue. And he went down there every month. I've got all his cards, his 4F cards. The man in uniform was the hero. Um, the enemy was that caricature I, I never got to see. Except in the newsreels, the enemy was the goose-stepping, cold, bloody Nazi, all that. I get, there was really, now there's an interesting contrast. And again, this is wonderful because I hadn't thought of these things. You know, the images I have, the, the black and white, cold, goose-stepping. Um, that was a fearful sound. That was a fearful sound. And and then all those young kids, those young sailors and soldiers jitterbugging with all the pretty girls on Saturday night. This complete lack of regimen, color, warmth, personality uh, contrasted against this stiff, cold, mindless. Oh, one other thing that's kind of interesting. On one of the newsreels, I went with my grandmother who had an entirely different way of seeing things than my mother or my father. And they showed, them, in the newsreel, they showed the German troops marching through somewhere or other, and everybody had a little bitty German flag, okay? I mean, everybody they showed, all these little people waving on those little flags. My grandma said, mm-hmm, that's staged. And I remember looking at her, because I staged, I didn't know what the word meant. She said, isn't that convenient? Every single one of them got a flag exactly like everybody else. That's staged. Well, guess what I saw 
when the people came home from the Persian Gulf. Identical little pea flags and everybody waving them. And it made me very uncomfortable. It made me extremely uncomfortable. Um, wait a minute. There's real and not real. Let's just keep Hollywood out. If people want to yell and throw confetti, let them yell and throw confetti. If they want to wave flags, let them wave whatever flag they have. You don't go in there and hand out flags and stage this thing. That is fiction. You know, that's, that's just as phony as it can be. But yes, the man in uniform was the hero. Any man in uniform was the hero. In fact, I didn't even realize I have a picture of myself wearing my cousin's bombardier hat. He was a bombardier. Um, I won't give you his name because he has preferred total privacy, and you would know him if I mentioned him to you, okay? He never spoke of the war. He had a very hard job. His job was to set the sights on the trains in Europe, and he knew that he was he knew he was stopping a terrible military machine, but he also knew that he was killing civilians. And that weighed upon him so heavily. He used to, you know, he'd come home and he'd say, I'll kill the soldiers. But to get them, I had to kill people who were innocent. And, and he never, you know, he, he never got over that. But I do, I have a picture of me wearing his hat. Um, oh, I wish I could have been grown and a man. Um, boy, what a hero I would have made. <laughs> I probably wouldn't have come back, but you know, who would have cared? It, it, was, um, it was a magnificent thing. It was bought and paid for. Our freedom, and, and I, I don't think I'll ever take it for granted. I'll never, and that's why I don't like whining. I hate whining. You know, I swear, over at the University of Georgia one time, somebody gave me this survey and it said, we're comparing any disparities between male and female salaries. And I, you know, I went straight to the head of the English department. Coben Freer knocked on his door. And he said, what can I do for you, Susan? I said, I'm just here to tell you, Coburn, if you ever try to pay me one penny more because I happen to be a female, you will have given me the biggest insult of my life. Being female is not something I achieved. It is an accident of birth. Don't you ever try to compensate me for something like that. And I feel adamant about that. I'm, I, get, I get so tired all the whining. There, were, there was that woman with four gold stars in her windows and friends, she was not whining. She paid the price. So all these people can whine. I hate that. I think it's a. I think it is a dangerous contagion, a very dangerous contagion. My youngins, my grand youngins, better not whine, or I'll talk to them. I'll talk to them. <laughs> well, let me ask you a little bit about the rest sure. of your life, just to, mm. to kind of blitz through some of this okay. and, and uh, give some uh, uh, factual variety. Yeah, stuff for the variety for the rest of this. Tell me about your your children. Okay. Could you tell me about the rest of your life? Certainly. Okay. Um, I followed the tradition of women everywhere. I went for one year of college, which was to give me a finish, whatever that was supposed to be, maybe some social grace or something. And then I married. I had, I married, I'm divorced now. Um, he graduated, Robert John Colgrove, he graduated from the Naval Academy in 1960. Maybe I did carry the hero in uniform. And he was a good man. He was a very fine man. Uh, we didn't make it, but he was a fine man. We have three children, Melanie Duanelle Colgrove, who was born in 1963, um, Eric William Colgrove, who was born in 1966, and John Dwight DeForest Colgrove, who was born in 1969. I came back to school as a 40-year-old sophomore. Um, I had finished my first year of college in 1958, and I came back in 1980. And um, God was very good. I got my bachelor's degree. I led my two sons through their educations. My daughter chose the military and did a wonderful job, served honorably. 
She is now the mother of two sons and married to a Navy man. Um, I stayed on for my master's degree in English. Was the undergraduate degree in English? Undergraduate degree in English, and that and 73 cents would get me a cup of coffee at the Waffle House. But I did go on for the master's, and at that time, I was working for this library. Made $3.35 an hour, stamping the name of the library in a book. Starting when? Mm -hmm, 84, mm -hmm. I think. And um, now I teach part-time for evening classes. Uh, I've written six novels, none of which has been published. It's okay. I don't write about people who whine and get what they whine about, which is <laughs> probably... Now, I like writing about people who reach down inside of themselves and find the strength they need to accomplish something. Um, I'm sure that my, my childhood has a great influence on it. When did you all move to Athens? 1980. My former husband had retired from the military in Andros Island, Bahamas. That was lovely. Four years. I brought back three young people, my children, who never did understand what the word peer pressure meant. I mean, they grew up wearing hibiscus flowers behind their ears. The boys, too. Nobody ever. And, and they grew up as completely independent individuals. And we came to the United States, and boy, were they ever in for a culture shock. We came here in 1980 so my former husband could finish his MBA at Georgia. And, um, of course, I was from Georgia originally, except, you know, for living with my down in Jacksonville for quite a while. But it was just ironic to find myself back where I'd had my one year of college. And then it turned out it's just nothing short of a miracle. A lot of hard work, a lot of money. You know, I mean, I'm still paying off loans. Hey, best money I ever spent. Um, so that one year of college was at the University of Georgia? That was at the University of Georgia, after which I went to work. My mother was a widow, and back then there weren't, goodness gracious, you couldn't just holler, you know, whine and get a scholarship. And it was okay. I mean, it worked out all right. Um, but I did, always wanted it. Always wanted it. No, I can't what were you it. studying for that one year, and then what were you working at when you <gasps> oh. the world of work? Okay. The one year I... I had won, I had won a music scholarship, and I did not want music. My mother wanted me to have music. Ironically, my younger son now, you see, is majoring in uh, music performance in graduate school at Notre Dame right now. So my mama finally got her musician <laughs> in her grandson, although she's passed away now. But I, I, won, I didn't want music. I just didn't want it. Um, and so I received a freshman scholarship to the University of Georgia for one year. And to be utterly truthful, I do sincerely believe the only reason I received that scholarship was because I had won a scholarship to a very prestigious girls' school in Atlanta. They had 100% of their graduates went to college. And then they hit me and I had nothing except a lot of willpower. And there's no way I would have gone to college. But it's okay. Fate, fate really does some interesting things. I think I got a scholarship because they didn't want to mess up their 100%. Well, it worked. Um, I came, majored in journalism. Oddly enough, I took three quarters of German. Loved it. Uh, loved the sound of the language. <laughs> there I was, so afraid of having to learn German when I was a little bitty thing. But it's okay when you decide you're going to do it. So um, I majored in journalism. I took German. I primarily majored in being sung to by rapturous young gentlemen beneath my dormitory window. Um, oh, it was wonderful, the panty raids. You know, it, it was great. I did all his homework. He made A's. I didn't get around to mine. I made C's. Um, that's okay. He sang love poems to me in the cemetery on Sunday afternoons, and I got my first kiss. Uh, which sounds funny to you, probably, that you don't get your first real kiss till you're in college. I got my first real kiss under the back portico of the Fine Arts Building. To this day, when I pass that portico, my knees wobble. 
I'm mean, I remember that. And I guess today's young people kind of think that's funny, but that's okay. Oh man, what a beautiful memory I have. <laughs> but then, you know, when I, when I came back in 1980 as, a, as the world's oldest sophomore, I discovered I had to take a fourth quarter of German. So I took it through independent study, which allowed me to review the other three quarters of German I had not thought of in 28, 9, 10, 22 years. And I had to pull a B to get into graduate school, and I did. Mm -hmm. I did. I did pull the B. It must have been awfully tough to go back to school then. Were, were, there, uh, were there any impressions that struck you uh, uh, returning? Oh yeah. The world of school and work. Oh yeah, because when, when I was here, it was, well, it was neat. Because number one, I had been out of the country for four years too, mm -hmm. so there had been a lot of changes going. When I was here in 1958, I can remember I had a date to go horseback riding. Now I'm not talking skin tight riding pants. I'm talking jodhpurs with the big old floppy sides to them, and boots. Do you know I was not allowed to leave the dormitory until I put a skirt on over the jodhpurs? Women were not allowed to leave the dormitory wearing slacks. Um, when you got ready to leave the dormitory, you had to go before the dorm mother and have her approve of your outfit. And I can remember, because I was outspoken even then, I can remember she made me go back and put a skirt on over my jodhpurs, and it really made me mad. I had a garish, bright red plaid skirt, and I put that on on top of my jodhpurs. And I walked back in there, and I said to her, and I would like to ask you what you think is going to excite my date more, to see me properly attired to go horseback riding or to watch me struggle out of my skirt in the car. And of course, it didn't do any good. They were the rules. But when I came back, the first thing I saw was a young hmm, woman wearing bib overalls without a blouse under them. <laughs> going, whoo, times have changed. Uh, everything had changed for women. Um, it was really... And the people made a big deal out of it. I didn't know I was really old to be going back to school until everybody made such a big deal out of it. You know, they sent me this thing, we're having special orientations for returning students and everything. Well, they really scared me pretty badly because they made out like it was something so unusual that I thought maybe I should be worried about it because they were kind of telling me maybe I should be worried about it or maybe they're trying to tell me I should whine about it, which isn't going to get it. But I just did what I had to do. It was the key to what I wanted. And, um, yeah, I was, you know, back in 1958, if you didn't pay your tuition on time, or if you failed a course, it was, well, goodbye, Charlie. And, and now, if you had trouble with something, there were all these people standing there, we'll give you help, we'll help you. It was very strange. Um, I kind of insisted on doing it my own way. Um, now, if I want help, I got enough smarts to ask for it. Don't come run around shoving flyers in my face all the time. Makes me think everybody assumes I'm going to have a problem if they're standing there with their hands out waiting for a solution to it. Um, yeah, it was very hard. A whole different way of seeing the world. I don't know whether it's better. It doesn't matter what I think anyway, you know. <laughs> Let me back up for a minute and okay. ask about when you when you were through with that one year of college in 58 mm -hmm. or so, um, you mentioned that you did go to work for a yes. while. And then I imagine you probably met your husband before too long. I did. But what were you working at? Or, and what, what, were the okay. what were the circumstances um, uh, around the time you met your husband? Okay. Um, I went to work for Independent Life Insurance Company in Jacksonville, Florida. 1959. I was making $27.50 a month, which sounds terrible, except I spent $5. It took $5 a month for me to have bus fare, dry cleaning, cigarettes, <laughs> um, lunch. So, $7 a month. I was living, all right, let me see. I was living with my grandmother again. Oh, yes, because she didn't pass away until 1962. So I was living with her, and my mother was a widow by then. So okay. Post Grove. I asked you about um, th that that circumstance, mm -hmm. um, living in Jacksonville and at your grandmother's house, I yes. believe. Yes, and I was working. Um, I had received a scholarship for my second year at the University of Georgia, but it was 
it was it did not pay. Well, women had to live in the dorms, okay, and I couldn't. Afford it. Women had to buy a meal ticket. You had to get it punched. You had to show it to your dorm mother. I mean, we were so stupid we might not remember to eat. And I, you know, I had male classmates who, pardon me, didn't have as much on the ball as I had. They got to live on the top floor of the Y and they live off peanut butter, and they got their degrees. And and I couldn't. I couldn't ask my mother to try to come up with anything else in the way of money. It was unheard of for anyone to work. <laughs> so I went to work for Independent Life Insurance Company as a clerk. Um, what did I do? I ran the first photostat machine in the city of Jacksonville. The thing took up a room the size of a big apartment. All the machinery was in there. Uh, big, big, heavy glass cover. You raise it up and you put a put a uh, insurance application in it and you lower this, th that glass must have been 10 pounds, lower that down, take a picture and then this piece of paper would travel through all these various baths and vats and dryers and stuff like this. And, and I met my former husband there when he was there in Jacksonville for his, uh, what do they call it? They don't call them sophomore, second class third class summer, his aviation training in Jacksonville, Florida, and I met him there. And um, we were engaged until his graduation day. He was not allowed to marry until he was through the Naval Academy. So we were married on his graduation day, June 8th, 1960. And uh, my job was just, my job was treading water until I found a man. Be I mean, I don't, I don't mean like a vulture. <laughs> I don't mean it sound that way. That's just what women did. You know, what did you, you do? You go to school for a while, if, you know, you, and then you get married and you raise a family. And I wouldn't change that. We've talked a lot mm -hmm. about the role of women. Um, you mentioned that both your parents worked at that store. Mm -hmm. um, and you've also mentioned your father's death. Mm -hmm. When was your father's death? And 1947. How much did, and how much did your mother spend working at the store? Did okay. she keep it going? She or? tried to, and that didn't work. Um, she tried to keep the store going, and I don't remember why it didn't work, but it didn't work. And she went to work then for the government, the Veterans Administration. And um, she really, I mean, she always came home and told wonderful things about what they talked about or what they had for lunch or what kind of things she was doing in her job. She always came home with a very positive attitude um, about work. I can remember thinking that it was too bad she had to work because I had friends whose mothers got to stay home with them, but, but I had my grandmother um, who really was more like me in personality. I mean, I loved my mother very much. She was a lovely lady. My grandmother and I were two peas in a pod. What um, did your grandmother do once she didn't need to watch the shores anymore? Not much. Not much. She, oh, wow. That's right, I remember. She made flowers out of parts of palm trees. And I guess I thought about that like I did about my mama cleaning out the fountain. And things seemed so trivial. Things seemed so unimportant, I guess, after that. But no, my, my grandmother, she remained very, very close to her family. And her two sons and my mother, you see, all lived right there in Jacksonville, and she remained a very, very active center to the family. And uh, all the grandkids adored her, but she was mine. And I, I mean, I always felt that way. Um, they just got to see her once in a while. I, I got to grow up with her. So I was extremely lucky, fine lady. Well, thank you very oh, much. Is there you. anything <laughs> that uh, we haven't covered that you would like to add in? I often mm. ask a last question. I'll, I'll, is there anything you care to add? Not that um, I think of. You know, if you you you've probably gotten <laughs> this, I can guess what you're going to say. But <laughs> last question, I, I told you I try to ask mm -hmm. the the make the ends the same. Is uh, if you're speaking with younger people who only knew of World War II from history and and from videos like this one, um, what do you think is most important that uh, they? Uh, uh, remember from the, the experiences we've talked about. I think the answer to that is something that sounds like a contradiction, but it isn't. 
I spoke of this unity, this strength of nation. I, I have spoken to you about how appalled I am at our segmentation. But you know something? The underpinning for that, that national feeling, that unity, was always the individual. The one person. Not black, not white, not male, not female, not, not young, not a one person. One person having the strength, finding it, making it, creating it, generating it, growing it, whatever you have to do to stand on your own two feet and do what you need to do in this world. Um, don't bleed off all this energy belly aching. Shut up and do it. Just do it. Do what you need to do. Because it's like if I were to say what things were like back then, this big, solid, steel tabletop of national unity was just underpinned by individuals who stood together, but who could have stood alone? if they had to. And I, I would love to see our young people have this pride in self, um, acceptance of self, feel good about yourself. And if you don't feel good about yourself, quit the whining. Find out what's wrong and fix it. Everybody acts like that's something no one's thought of. Well, it can be done. Yes. And if any of my descendants are listening, listen to me. <laughs> because I'm telling you the truth. It can be done. Just do it. Just do it. I feel very strongly about that, as you can tell. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I appreciate it.